Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. The book of Jeremiah chapter 31. Once again, I'm declaring the same thing I've been saying. Unless the Holy Spirit shows us the scriptures, we will not know the depth that is residing inside a word of God. One of the popular things that we know in uh, when you study homiletics, to know the contextual, historical setting, to know the intention of the author, which is all good by the paper and it's important. But there are also prophetic applications and prophetic understandings of scripture which we don't attempt to say what it means, but we have to say it because the Lord is the one who's taking those scriptures and applying it to the present situation. Amen? So that is why one of the things that as we study God's word, we ask God, teach us. Why am I so amused? Because I've been studying deep enough at least with my heart, not with my head, from the time I'm 15 and a half to now. And I see the same passages are changing as I'm growing and maturing in the Lord. The same passage that I know, now it's so different. Therefore, God teaches us all the time according to our growth and maturity. Amen? Amen. You cannot say, I've already studied it, I know it. Right. Every time we think we know, it is something so different. Because we are growing, not God is not changing, we are growing. We are now able to understand the deeper things of God. Amen? Amen. And so, when I look at this passage, again you tend to admire the depth that is there. And we have been discovering verse by verse, it's not my intention to keep talking about it. You know, some people do uh, topical exploration, uh, sermon, uh, 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 biographical and topical. It's just a little bit longer sermon series, but my intention is just go with the flow. If the Lord is saying, study it together, let's study it together. Amen? Amen. Now, of course, when my uh, son kept asking me, so it is grace in the wilderness part something, I said, yes. Then it dawned on me, that is how long it takes for us to be trained in the wilderness. We all want the outward response or results of the wilderness, but it's the wilderness that will determine whether you will make it, whether you'll drop, yeah. I'll die, or you will stand up. The enemy wants us to give up. Our friends will encourage to give up. Our loved ones will say, ring the bell and get out, because we are crying, we are screaming. But the instructors will keep saying, don't give up, push yourself through. And I believe that's the, what, the play, the Holy Spirit plays like a divine coach in our life. Don't give up. Because I'm empowering you, I'm strengthening you. The only thing he cannot do or he will not want to do is to tweak the will. That part we have to give in. Grace in the wilderness. No matter what the challenges are, therefore... No matter, sorry, excuse me, regardless of the challenges, we have faith that we will make it through the end times. Amen. Because there was a lot of fear which was imposed in the early uh, uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, the kind of movies that was produced, 666, Antichrist and so on and dying and all that will be true. But imposing fear was not the notion of God. Fear is an outproduct of anything humans are afraid of. I mean, come on, getting married is a glorious thing, but people are afraid the night before. They just get frightened, it's anxiety, it's excitement, whatever not. So you cannot use fear as your denominator. It is just a response. But there are people who will give you the courage to keep up going, or, since you have fear, give up. Because anything from God does not produce fear. That is absolutely not true. Are you listening? Please do not let that feeling of fear lead you. Fear is a good response if you know how to tame it. Fear is not the response. But some people use 
Fear as that point of responding. If they don't fear, they don't prepare. So they will stir that fear, the anxiety, so that they start preparing for the exams. It's coming. Oh, I better prepare. Oh, oh. Uh, 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 the performance anxiety kicks in. Human way of doing is the anxiety response. But as we mature in God, let the peace of God take over and lead you. Amen. That is a matured level. It's not 101. It is 202 and above. Then you are sitting at peace. I remember going to a conference, a brand new conference, and the translator was uh, assigned to me. I was just praying there. The, 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 the translator told me, he tapped on my shoulder, and he said, uh, uh, don't be afraid, pastor. I said, okay, thank you. And I was praying. Third, second time, he tapped me again. Uh, don't be afraid, God is with you. Amen. Praise God. Third time, he is about to touch me. I said, don't touch me again. Are you afraid? He said, yes. Then tell it to yourself. <laughs> Why are you telling it to me? And you are tapping me while I keep praying. You, you know. I said, brother, when I went up, are you afraid to wish the crowd? Yes. Don't worry. God is with you. So sometimes people, when they have fear, they, put, they translate it to another person. The mirror effect, they project it to another person and to cause everybody to have fear. Do you understand? The Bible says God has not given us what? So there is a human response of fear. There is also what we call the spirit of fear. Bible says God has not given you that spirit of fear. The human response of fear is a value that is inside you as a human creation. It is given for you as a watchdog to tell you what to do. Either fear or flight. Remember, fight or flight is a response given. So fear is one of these things that kicks it in. But the spirit of fear is not given by God. Amen? Amen. So grace in the wilderness, God will help us through, through the wilderness because that is the school of training for all warriors to come through. You can't avoid that. So you make peace with God and go through the process. Amen. So we are going to meditate this uh, morning. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 11. The book of Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 11. The Bible says, For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. I want to read that again for you. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob. In other words, God has paid for him. And has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. Therefore, in this morning's study of Jeremiah 31 verse 11, we're going to study together experiencing a higher level of authority in your life. When God delivers you from hands too strong, that means God is preparing you, preparing you to receive a higher level of authority. You cannot fight small demons and get a higher dose of authority. It doesn't work that way. According to the measure of your fight, you will receive one level up. Are you ready? And this is God's way of doing. You have to know this is God's way of doing. Every time we pray, God, give me your power. Give me authority. And all that he does, he opens the cans of, can of worms in our heart, in our soul. It will all start coming out. And you don't know why you're going through this. Because you ask for the power and God has to clean up the soul. It will come out. Sometimes we don't realize those things are hidden and God's eyes, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, His Spirit is all the time searching inside, right? If you ask for more, it will start stirring and come up. The more He's going in, the more He will start clearing it up so that nothing hinders the flow of His Spirit. Amen. Amen. We don't understand that that is the process. Because God doesn't pour things because anything that goes in into an old wineskin process the new wine will burst the wineskin. Do you understand that, right? And that is why there is a process when God says, no one, no one, no one, pause. What did Jesus say? New wine into old wines. He said, no one. Say the word no one. No one. Are you ready? Yes. He said no one again. No 
but he didn't say god will not no human being will do that it's a logic of physics it will burst but he didn't say god will not he uses the young and the old the next line says god not only uses the new he also needs the old how why is that a phrase there and that is why when you misunderstand the scripture or overzealously apply the scripture then we are all the time paying attention to the younger generation the newer generation and then we come up with phrases that this generation belong to the youth tell me which part of the bible says that every person has that season when you were younger you had the same thing right generation belong to, it empowered you oh, you start living for god and then now you're getting older means what your season is gone and that is why many people as they have grown older they retire glad fully and they give the baton to others and they take up a fishing rod <laughs> it's the time to go fishing while the others will do ministry no that's not what god is asking you to do he needs the young and the old somebody say Amen. that is why in the in the joel's prophecy yes the young men will see Uh, dreams uh, uh, visions and prophesy the old again the old is being mentioned why it doesn't come on you because you have a problem acknowledging you are old <laughs> you don't want to accept that you are getting old no i'm still young so you get stuck into the first part of the prophecy <laughs> it's true you got to accept that well this is what's happening and though when god has reserved he kicks in the apostolic wisdom that you have accumulated over your life and you will start speaking to the life of the sons and the daughters amen? amen that requires you to accept where you are so that that river comes onto your life amen and so we are now getting ready for a new level of authority it is not just to say wow praise god and the church gets excited see i don't really, i really don't believe in flattery preaching i i can't when there are bigger victories that means there are bigger wars to fight amen not everybody is geared up for that you cannot fight the lord's battles if you have outstanding personal battles you cannot be diligent in god's warfare if you are not diligent to fight your personal warfares because god seasons us in our personal warfare first before entrusting the lord's warfares Sometimes our personal warfare and the Lord's warfare engages itself simultaneously. Because as you are learning here, you will fight there, and sometimes when you are learning in God's warfare, you will engage your personal warfare and bring victory to your own life. Amen. Some people ask me why is not God speaking to me? Because you are speaking to God one way. Why is not God telling me to do because there are so many unsettled issues in your own life. God can and will not and should not I think speak to a church which is sick full of itself. It's only when we empty our soul when he says now I want to speak to you. Is so one of the ways for God to speak to us is to empty our own agenda and say God can you speak? I'm here to hear you speaking. Imagine a time that you're not doing anything just to hear Lord it's your day just speak to me anything you want you don't have to speak but you know it's like you know children sometimes they cry they're not asking anything from you they just want to hold your hand and walk around. As long as they hold your hand they are so happy. Amen. And sometimes that's what God wants to do. I don't want to speak to you anything but I enjoy your company. I just want to hold your hand. the company of jesus is the greatest authority that you can have and you must know how to settle in in the presence of god not all the time making noise not all the time asking for a word the bible is full of words go and get dig one for yourself amen so god is preparing us however the enemy is creating a showdown and so god is preparing his army So God is giving us short time to deal with short accounts whatever that is going through. Do you remember during the first 7 days of the time that uh, we waited upon God in fasting and prayer I I prophesied to you 
in one of those days that I had an encounter with the Lord where he brought me up into the heavens and I saw a new galaxy. Do you remember that? Yesterday, Yahoo News, a new galaxy was discovered. Because in that encounter that I had, the Lord said, this galaxy will be soon discovered and I will show to people. Unless God shows, no one can see it. And I also mentioned it was not, uh, uh, not the seven days, but few days, a uh, uh, few uh, uh, months before that, was that I saw a plane falling down. Last Wednesday, while the service was going on, WBTV, a uh, uh, passenger, uh, not passenger, thank God, it's a smaller plane, but the pilot died. It was on the main highway, I-85. I'm not happy to say all this when people die. I'm just telling you that God can show before it happens. We don't get validated by the fulfilled prophecies. God shows himself. He knows the future. Amen. I don't need to have this validation. My validation comes from God. Jesus died on the cross and I accepted. That is enough validation for me. You don't have to validate. And I want to encourage you and those who are watching online, don't Go around validating yourself with fulfilled prophecies. Because the prophecy was from God. He fulfilled it. You are just a secretary that took note and told everybody else. You don't have to make your ministry make money through those things. Amen. 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 A through man and a woman of God will walk in the fear of God when these things are happening. What is happening to us, for us now? God is true. The world don't have to fear the Lord. We are so busy Telling the world, fear the Lord. If the church, his bride, doesn't fear him. Amen. So the first group of evangelism or re-evangelism takes place in our own home. We bring the fear of the Lord to our own lives. We bring the fear of the Lord to our own children. Who knew Jesus and then do not know Jesus. Outside, they don't know Jesus. They have tasted the world. You tell them God, they fear God. Our children struggle because we keep them away from the world. And the moment they discover, then they go out. So they work harder to tone down the Holy Spirit. It takes a lot of effort to do that, you know. Are you with me? And so a grace in the wilderness, in these end times, we have to prepare ourselves for God to release a new authority. Amen. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, the word tribulation does not necessarily mean the seven years that is to come. It is also the everyday troubles that we're going through. Why we are going through everyday troubles? It somehow refines us, strengthens us with the bigger troubles that we will face. Now, this is the last generation. Amen. If Jesus comes by next month, all of us will go through it. But next month will not come because the seven years... Antichrist rule has not started. You still do not know who the Antichrist is. Therefore, the seven years has not started. Isn't that an easy calculation? Yes. So don't buy unnecessary book that tells you Antichrist is here, Antichrist is there. When Antichrist will come, he comes, he is a political leader. The whole world will know. It will be declared as a one world government dictator. Yes. You don't have to go rat hunting. He is not going to hide like a rat. He will sit on the top world chain, governments. Whoever you think superpower today will be under power on that day. It is so clear and so crystal, you don't have to wonder whether it has started. How is that? So what are we going to be busy doing? Busy preparing our hearts for what God has in store for our lives. Jesus said, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And so that troubled me. You see, when I'm thinking theologically, I'm thinking, I'm thinking relationally. People use this phrase. I think some of you guys who are older in the Lord will understand what I'm saying. 
You think about this. Synonymously, this statement is quoted. As I have overcome the world, you too should overcome the world. Have you heard this before? And I've been searching the scriptures where these two joins together. Where these two joins together. You know, I've been searching a lot more. Maybe it's then different translation that I didn't pay attention to. I've heard it so many times as I've overcome. But then there is another scripture which I want to show you. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, the book of 1 John, the epistle of 1 John chapter uh, 5, verse 4, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Are you following? Yes. So now Jesus said this way, you will have peace. You will have tribulation. I have, you know, you, are, you have me. You will have tribulation. Fear not. I have overcome the world. Now, he did not say, you too must overcome. He didn't finish that line. Because at this process, talking to his disciples, the cross of Calvary has not been accomplished yet. Once the cross of Calvary has been established, he rose from the dead. He gave his Holy Spirit into us. Now, 1 John now makes the connection. Because Jesus is in you, when your faith is strengthened and linked up to him, through him, you now can become an overcomer, not by yourself. And that's the connection you must make. That is why people do not have Jesus. They will not be able to overcome, no matter how you teach them and train them. We talk about relapse theory in addiction, relapse theory in uh, alcohol addiction or drug and all kinds of addiction. Huh? We have to have a re relapse and recovery process. So it is even in the church. When you're talking about discipleship, we have almost like a parrot answer. Uh, what is the goal of discipleship? People give a very parrot answer because the goal of discipleship is to be what? Make disciples, do this, do that, do this, do that. The goal of, uh, some people say the, the goal of discipleship is to make disciples. You look at the scripture right inside the heart, is to be like him. He doesn't say anything else as your goal. The goal of discipleship is not to grow the church. It is an offshoot. The goal is to be like Christ. And when you are being like Christ, you'll do everything which Christ loves and wants to do. So overcoming is one of the authority that comes inside like an infusion when God comes into your soul, when the Holy Spirit comes inside. The moment you lack authority, instead of learning scriptures to rebuke, go back and spend time with Jesus inside his place. It comes out with authority. Authority increases your time spent with Christ, not chanting scriptures thousand times because it's not a mantra. Are you following? Yes. It is not a formula. Say this seven times and say that three times. You have to have, and I, I know all the teachings, so please don't get me wrong. All that are important. When a moment a person is not in Christ, everything else is futile. It's to get them back into their walk with God so that their mind is not thinking of techniques. It keeps focus on relationship with Him. Have you, did you notice that sometimes God will tell you, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. He rebukes all the demons without you saying anything. Because of His relationship, the Bible says, because He knows my name, Psalms chapter 91. Because he knows my name, I will deliver him. Tell me which part of it, this part where the person was involved. Nothing. Because he knows my name. Because you are so engrossed in worshipping, in discovering his word, lost in his, the goodness of his presence. You forgot to pray and rebuke all the different demon pointers that you had. You know, Lord, this, this, because you know his name, he will take care of it. And that's a relationship I want to encourage you. 
to come closer with God. Last week we had uh, uh, the architect who introduced by Pastor Jeff, and he came to check out the barn so that we can come up with an idea, what kind of barn we, you know, how we want to put it, and so on and so forth, right? So after he left, we went inside the tent to pray. When we stood there at the tent, this angel that all the time I've seen since the day I came into this place, he stepped in. When he stepped in, he stood. For once after many, many, many years, the Lord allowed me to see the complexion of his face. I've seen angels too many times, but I don't bother to check their skin tone. I, I know different, but you know, I'm not the one who get distracted. Or, uh, I'm paying attention to their message and why did they come there. But this time the Lord showed me the skin tone, his face structure, the cheekbone structure, the way very strong, muscular, very uh, uh, tough looking guy. And, and, you know, and he was quietly standing together with us to pray. And I'm asking the Lord, he said he comes from this high ranking prayer uh, angel who's assigned to this property. So you see, we are not building just another pr uh, uh, prayer barn. Everybody builds a prayer barn which is noble and godly. They do because what God told them to do. Amen? So are we. So in your lifetime, you would have heard all these too many times. On every other church, you would have done that. But look at the amount of encounters God is giving from day one. If you want to spend your money, let's do something that matters and not just because everybody is doing it. Amen? Amen? So there is a cost to it. We know there are angelic authority that is surrounding us and we have to pay attention to all the things God is doing. God is preparing us to overcome the world. Amen. Amen? It happens all the little things in our life. Handling all the little foxes that spoils the wine. Our notion of handling little foxes is not perfection, but godliness. Are you following? Even godly people will have holes in the armor. And that's why we are dependent on God. Perfection makes us to be sinless. And the moment you reach the human perfection, it produces pride. But godliness does not. It creates a dependency on God. It, it makes it realize. Because the moment you say, I am godly, I don't have to confess any sin anymore. Sin enters your heart. Isn't it? So godliness is the acknowledgement of what Christ has done. That I'm dependent on him. And the authority of Christ. It is so easy as a church. So listen, guys. It is so easy as a church to get distracted by our gift. It is so easy. Oh, we are a prophetic church. Let's just start prophesying and become like a spiritual hooligan. Or all that we want to do is the spiritual warfare side of it. And we don't care about the basics of what church is all about. You know, being in Singapore military... Some of my friends went into the Navy. And you're talking about big battleships, man. What are you assigned? And one of my friends, he was assigned as a cook in the military ship. So he feels very embarrassed to say that, what are you doing in the Navy? I'm a cook. But he says it in a very shy tone, like, you know, I'm a cook. But he doesn't realize that he is the guy who's keeping everybody alive. <laughs> He's the guy who's keeping everybody motivated. He's the guy who's thinking of feeding the soldiers to stand in the battlefront. Amen? Amen? There is no one who is not important in the house of God. There is only two types of people or two types of soldier. One who gets to see the enemy and the other one who doesn't get to see it. But they all the time in battle order. They put on their weapons and even cooks are told when they go to engage in a battle order, the weapons must be with them. When it's required, they too must fight. Amen? Amen. 
God wants to give an authority, and this is how God can give us authority. I want to put put it. Uh, I place some points so that we can remember God authority and human authority, the God's way of authority, and the way God does not give authority. We have also have to distinguish between natural authority and supernatural authority. When God gives us the authority, He gives us by lifting us up by promotion. Look at Daniel. I want to give the points and we talk about other things, okay? Point number one, God can promote you because promotion brings authority. Hello? Hello? Sometimes in the workplace, let's say you're being put down all the time. And you're praying, God, lift me up. Lift me up so others don't put me down. So in order to lift you up, he has to promote you. In order to be promoted, you you need to be diligent in your work. And that diligence is your problem, isn't it? Being coming to work on time is the problem now. Sleeping on time is the problem now. Not giving excuse is the problem now. Finishing more than what you are set to do is the problem now. Or I just do for what I'm paid. Are you sure? Because Jesus said, if one person tells you to go one mile, how many? Two miles. And then Paul said, all of us who serve whatever work that we are doing, serve as though you are serving Jesus. Did he say that? You see, you want God to intervene in your workplace, then that workplace must come under God's domain. It must come under that authority of God. You can see demons in front of your supervisors, but God can populate that with angels and turn around those situations. God can and God will. Amen. Ah, but you don't know my supervisor. I think I know the devil good enough. (laughs) Every other person is better to change. Don't worry about it. Ah, you don't know which hell she come from. You see, if God cannot change them, he will remove them out of your past. God will bless them with another work, another job, and God will give you supervisors who nurture you. Amen? Amen. The moment God decides to nurture you, no devil in hell can stop that. Do you understand? When you sign up in, in the school of God, no one can stop that process. And that is why our workplace must become God's domain. It doesn't come by we working the same way by putting another person down. It doesn't come by that way. It comes by God lifting us up. God wanted to lift up Daniel, but look at the circumstances in which way God chose that. Number two, he placed us in challenging circumstances. Look at the life of Joseph. God wanted to lift him up, but God has to put him in challenging circumstances. Number three, God lifts us up, gives us supernatural authority by giving divine encounters. And I want you to look about, think about the life of Moses. Now, whatever points I'm giving, it's another series by itself. But I'm just quoting all the points now. Divine encounters releases supernatural authority in your life. So that is why I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, you cannot say, I saw Jesus and you lack in authority when you face the problems. You cannot say, the Lord just spoke to me and you don't produce fruit. You can't. Pastor Jeff used a very interesting word where the Lord told him to, uh, to, to, to go and harvest. Did he say low-hanging fruits? How did he say it? Low-hanging fruits. If you can't give fruits on a very high level, at least give us low-hanging that is so easy to pluck. Uh, hello? Yes. But if no fruit, that has to be dealt with by God. You cannot say, I don't have one. Either low or high, give somewhere. But you must be bearing fruit. Amen? Oh, Jesus came and cursed the fig tree. Uh, commentaries say, uh, all the commentaries are saying, it is not the season. Don't you think Jesus knows that? Do you want God to bless you seasonal? No, we want God to always bless us. (laughs) Then why are you asking seasonal fruit bearing? So that was the lesson we learned from that fig tree. He was showing a parabolic understanding. You are not a tree, so don't talk like a tree, seasonal. 
you are humans and that is why the bible says in in psalms chapter 1 verse 3 and also in uh, the book of uh, uh, Ezekiel, that you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Every month of the year, you shall bear fruit. Amen. Amen. That means you and I will have 12 seasons with God. Amen. The 12 varieties of God. The 12 graces of God. All the different months will produce a different grace of God. Amen. When I came to America, one of the things I can't stop admiring the homemakers is that in different seasons, they buy different stuff and change the whole house around. <laughs> it almost looks like a shopping mall each time you go to the house. It's very different. The color is different. The, you know, because that's how it works, right? It, you're so excited to... The only thing that is, can't be changed is the husband and the children. <laughs> the unmovable things <laughs> or immovable things. Huh? Otherwise, the house looks very pretty, very nice. God's spirit can come and fill you up in a new way. Somebody say amen. amen. Divine encounters releases authority in your life. And that's the way you counter check whether the divine encounter is from God or self-made. You cannot say, I saw Jesus and I lack in authority. It doesn't come that way. You cannot say, I saw Jesus and then I don't have any more power to overcome. Yeah. Even if you've just met with Jesus for 0 0.3 seconds, that amount of authority will come in. Amen. So show that before giving up. It is a fair game, isn't it? Yeah. According to the measure you measure, it shall be measured back to you. And point number four, divine, as a divine anointing, Jesus can give us authority. The Bible says, Luke chapter 4, verse 14, he came back in the power of the Holy Spirit. We heard that from uh, uh, Sister Lee and also Pastor Jeff in his preaching last uh, week. Oh, was it last week? Wednesday. He came back in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus. But in verse 31 and 32, you'll find that when he preached, he was a man who had authority. Now, the fact that he had authority made him so different from the Pharisees because the Pharisees have been preaching all their life. Nobody paid attention. But this man spoke with authority. Amen? There is no trouble of the book of Isaiah. They all have heard it too many times. They know by heart the laws of God. The Pharisees know it by memory because they practice scriptural memory, memorization. They have to say it so many times. It's part of their life. So when Jesus opened the book of uh, Isaiah, it was not a problem. They were so happy and delighted. You know, when the war started in the synagogue, when he said, today this scripture is fulfilled. The moment he said, today it's fulfilled, war broke down. That's why the demons will guard until you say you are experiencing God. The moment you experience God, you are no longer operating in a religious spirit. You're operating in the rivers of life. You can say all you want, I used to know God. I know that book. I used to read this. As long as you say today it is fulfilled, all hell will start breaking loose. That's the real war to fight. That is your war. Are you with me? And so the moment some people get this kind of demonic challenges, they will stop having the divine encounters with God because they are afraid. The more I see, the more it hits me, so I better don't see. And that's what the enemy will do, to intimidate his people. Amen. Amen. Think about it. So number four, divine anointing releases authority. And number five, God's favor on your life releases authority. See, there are many ways God's authority will come upon us. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and men. Look at that. 
Look at the promotion that comes because God's favor rests on you. Like everybody else, I've been into the military in Singapore. And I have to obey God's rules of promotion. A lot of my friends, they will buy coffee and tea for the officers every morning. At least they get the $50 promotion for the year. They'll do, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, sir, no, sir, like, like, uh, like a slave dog. Of course, you have to do all that. But you don't carry favor in the midst of opposition. But I saw those scriptures, you see, that when you find favor with God, promotion comes towards you. Of course, I am, I'm one of the good guys, good uh, 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 cadets or soldier. I will do all that the guys will tell me to do. But there are many things that we went into military uh, training in, 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 in the jungle where they will ask you to do stuff that is not even according to the rule book. For example, one of those examples. Now, I'm not saying in any pride, but it was my conviction at the time. We went for field training. And so we have to have opposition uh, groups where you have to counter enemy and soldier tactics, right? You have seal, uh, seal uh, field signals that you have to give while the enemy is coming. Now, signals are almost generic. So my group decided to change all the signals. So if someone is looking through the binoculars, they will not know what we are communicating. So my brilliant sergeant came up with Every vulgar word he could think as a signal. Every vulgar word that he, if he says this many times, that's what it means. So you got to change the whole thing, right? So everybody has to say, everybody has to memorize. And it came to me. And I said, I'm not going to say it, man. He was screaming, he was challenging. Whatever I, I will do, I'll do. You'll be charged, seven days, detention barrack. I said, that's not a problem. Why? I don't wish to say whatever he was saying, but intimate, that's against my religious principles. So, went back to unit. I was told to wear uh, uniform number four. Every time they ask you to uniform number four, that means you're going to be charged. So I went, met my officer, and uh, these were the charges. Insubordination. I said, sir, I want to know what is insubordination according to military law. Is vulgarities is part of military law. It is against my religious beliefs. And so if I have to be charged, I'll be charged. He said, what? So tell me what are your field signals. So I told him, oh, these are all the field signals this guy has to say. And now the charge was against him. Because these are not military signals. These are your personal game to win against the another team. And you can't have false charges against you. Just for that moment, God has to overturn the plate. And sometimes you just don't know when you are overturned or when you are going in. We are not supposed to stand for God or not stand for God thinking about results. Our job is to stand. The results is in the hand of God. In both ways, whether I'm in or whether I'm out, I'll praise the name of God. Amen. My brothers and sisters, and this is just one of those, man. For two years, they came up with all kinds of things to put things on me, to send me into detention barrack, all because they see me walking around with the Bible all the time. I had people saved in the camp. People were healed in the camp. Soldiers were touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. We started a revival meeting in the camp. Amen. Amen. Favor comes because you honor Jesus. It can be any type of situation in your workplace or in your school. You ask God for favor. For a change, try these methods. Number six, favor comes because of divine impartation. Luke chapter 10, 19 says, I've given you power and authority over all the power of the enemy. Now, you didn't ask for it. But the moment you became a child of God, an impartation of authority entered into your spirit man. It is a deposit of heaven. Use it. Don't just keep it there. Don't forget it is inside there. I remember I told you about this testimony. <clears throat> this will make Angeline very happy, actually. <coughs> when, you know, you couldn't buy the milk for the children and this and that and 
So I was praying, God, where is your providence? Where is your providence? How can I go through all this? And I was praying, you know, very ardently, very fearfully, uh, very uh, full of tears and travailing before God. So now you're waiting for some answers from heaven to come. And the Lord said, are you ready for what he said? Maybe that's your breakthrough. It's a answer there. Are you ready? Yes. Angeline says, is she already ready? She's saying yes. Say it. Say it out. He said, clean up your drawers. Say, what? That's not the answer I was waiting for, man. How can the Lord tell me, clean up your drawers? And so my heart was so dissatisfied that day. Yeah, I'm praying of important things and he tells me, go and clean up your drawers. So I went to the whole different rooms and I was cleaning up, cleaning up. And my master room, when I was cleaning up, there was there the $3,000 in an envelope which I forgot completely for almost two years. <laughs> clean up your drawers. It's not that I have not provided. You have forgotten. Somebody say amen. amen. Angeline uses that as an excuse and she keeps telling me, clean up your drawers. <laughs> God supplies when you fall short. Huh? But you know what people do? They don't want to touch their bank account. They always ask, can you please help? Hello, what happened to your account first? Use it. Because when you use this, God tops it up. Faith tops it up. But I don't want it, I don't, I don't want it to go up. I don't want it to go down. So it's okay for another person's bank account to go down. You don't want your account to go down. Huh? And it applies to even church. All the time you hear in the TV, you hear the evangelists, you hear the pastors keep saying, give us the money to reach out to the world. Sometimes I feel like screaming and telling, sell your car, that will produce about $50,000. Sell your plane, that's about $26 million. Sell your house, you'll get $10 million now. Why all the time you're asking from those who don't have the poor people who think you are really reaching out to the world when you're living a presidential lifestyle. Nothing wrong with all this, but the way you ask as though you don't have when your ministry bank account have millions of dollars stacked up, properties all around to say, it. why don't you just sell one house and go for Africa? Take that for missions and trust God. When you come back, God will provide. Why not? Everybody else is doing it, isn't it? Why not for a change? Now, I'm not saying anything wrong in being prosperous. Whenever God prospers you and the way God prospers you, when he gives you the money, use what you have, he tops it up. The principles of God. When you have the money, you don't want to use. You just ask him, you know, brother, please help me, man. We need money, man. That is called robbery. Yeah. And God says, have you robbed me? Whenever God told us to do things, and even many of you know how we bought this place, right? He didn't ask me how much you have in the bank account. He didn't ask me. He never asks me. Praise God, he never asked me. The only one who asked me is the treasurer. Do you know how much money? I don't want to know. I don't want to see. But not our treasurers. They gave up on me. My Singapore treasurers. <laughs> Do you know we don't have enough? So what? Faith has enough. Don't worry about it. But pastor, but pastor. I tell you what, you go to the corner and do your pastor thing while I'm busy having faith and doing things. Amen. <laughs> Till today, we are still doing good. Somebody say. Amen. People say, oh, post-COVID, we may go broke. God knows his church, man. God knows his church. As long as we stick in the center of God's will, just do what he tells us to do, he will provide for the game. The worry is not the money. The will of God is your challenge. Authority comes by impartation. And number seven, I want to say, authority comes as a result of obedience. See, there are different levels of authority God releases. One of it comes by obedience. The Bible says, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. The one who conquers, to, who keeps my work, 
until the end. To him, I will give authority over the nations. So my question now for you is, assuming this scripture is being quoted while you're already in heaven, okay? Why do you need authority over the nations? You're no longer there. What is that for you to command among the nations? So you realize that sometimes the pre-tribulation theory is being in check. Even when you overcome, when God gives you an authority, it becomes an active overcoming lifestyle. You cannot say, I've overcome, I put the crown, that's it, I'm done. God sends his trained soldiers for the next battle. Somebody say amen. amen. Until the battle stops. When is that? We thought, well, the second coming of Jesus is the final accumulation of the day. No, it is not. After that, the thousand-year reign. After the thousand years, then finally, Lucifer is thrown to the depths of the lake of fire, and then, kaboom, the story finishes. Pastor Stephen, what happens next? I don't know. We will reign with Jesus. What happens next? <clears throat> I really don't want to know, man. I'm busy discovering Jesus then. Are you with me? Spiritual authority comes as part of those things. The second thing about all the spiritual authority the Lord wants to share with you, are you learning something this morning? Another part of spiritual authority is supernatural warfare, but the Lord showed me something that I want to share with you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Now guys, put it up in the amplified version, please. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical. That means not flesh and blood. They are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. Verse 5 says, what are the strongholds? We refute arguments, theories, reasonings, and every proud and lofty thing that self sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We lead every thought and purpose away, captive into the obedience of Christ, the anointed one. Now look at the homework that is given in spiritual authority or pulling down strongholds. Number one, wrong thinking and reasoning will cause you to lose your authority. You got to think right for the authority to work. Do you understand? The moment you have faulty... Okay, just to talk about guns and whatever not, since you are talking about military. In, in all those guys, you know, or, or ladies, when you handle guns and you know how to shoot, one of the things about guns is there will be ammunition that will be faulty, equipment that will be faulty. So it's not just the fun of shooting and bang, bang, bang and all of that. But when it's, there is a bullet that is stuck or there is a faulty, you know how to clear your weapon and you know how to check it. If not, this weapon in your hand is as good as you don't have it. In other words, you die first. Are you with me? And this is what one of the things Paul is trying to teach us. God has given you the authority to cast down strongholds. And the anointing to cast down strongholds in you, but you can lose it with wrong reasonings. You can lose that with wrong thinking process. Kenneth Hagin wrote a small booklet called Wrong Thinking Produces Wrong Faith. Therefore, right thinking produces right faith. Just simple books like this, you know. And that is why people love uh, Brother, K uh, Brother Hagen, because he made complex things very simple, everyday lifestyle. Amen? That's the second thing that will help us or make us to lose the authority is arguments. Are you arguing with God all the time? I want to settle my score with God. Are you sure? Because arguments... Loses your authority, and that is why we lose our children, because when they go to school, they're exposed to philosophy, they question God, and they start arguing with the Creator. The, they lose the authority to walk with God. And many of them are lost the moment they take that subject. 
Why? Most of the subjects are thought sadly by atheists, people who don't like God, and those who are offended with God, and they teach that subject with such an authority, our children tend to think he must be right because there is a tone of authority in what he's speaking. You know why our children think that way? Are you ready to hear the answer? Yes. You ready? Yes. Online, are you ready? Huh? Because all their life they have heard preaching without authority. So when they go to schools, they listen to all these atheistic people who are offended with God. They preach with such an authority, they think that must be right. Because the truth that I hear, and all this time I've been hearing in church, lacks the authority of conviction. And that is why we have to regain our grounds back. If you believe this is God's word, you believe this is the right way, then don't suggest, direct them to the truth. Too long we have been preaching suggestive preaching. For many years as I served in Australia, I know my pastor friends will say, uh, we are going to let the offering back pass. If you like, you can put something. If you don't like. So one day I got so mad with these statements, I went up and asked, tell me in which part of the scripture says, if you like, you can give. The Bible says, when you give. Not if you like, you can give. You see, the moment as preachers we misquote the scripture, then the authority of God doesn't come through. Encourage people. If you have five cents, drop it into the box. Let God multiply that. Don't say if you like. Why are you robbing them, man? Lead them to the truth. I can be wrong, but God is never. Amen. God is never wrong. He always multiplies. Amen. You see, wrong thinking robs your authority. Wrong arguments rob, uh, robs your authority. And the third thing the Bible says here, wrong theories rob your authority. You read all kinds of books which is not wired in the right way, robs your authority. And number four, anything that is against the knowledge of God, that creates a misalignment in your knowledge of God's word, reinterprets in the scripture that it doesn't sound right. It may sound good, but it may not sound right. You lose the authority. Then another thing came. Listen carefully. He says, leading. Say the word lead. lead. Lead means it's your job. You do the leading. Your reasoning cannot lead you. You are set free by Christ. You lead your thought patterns with the word of God. Somebody say. Amen. Sometimes it's like a, a tuition. You got to go through it. Today I can quote scriptures to you. I can walk, talk a little bit more stronger. But nobody knew the days when we had dot matrix printer. Do you remember those days? <laughs> when you print one document, the whole house will know you are printing. The only problem in my house, can you stop printing, please? From morning to night, it is printing scriptures, confession lists. And I got a stack of confession lists for every situation. What do I do in my prayer time? In my fasting time, I will kneel before God and keep reciting those scriptures into my spirit, man. Keep reciting over and over because I'm tutoring my spirit. I'm tutoring my soul how to depend upon God. David said, Oh my soul, why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, from whence comes your help. He didn't allow his heart or his soul to dictate him. His spirit man was teaching his soul, hope in God. Only through God, your help is going to come. Amen. So the homework that we do to retutor and reprogram our soul patterns is more important than the answers. Because when you get it right, everything will fall into place. Are you with me? And the moment I finish, I'll print new scriptures again. More new scriptures will be coming again. Every time I discover the mercy of God, I discover the favor of God, I discover the grace, I discover another new word, I'll print it and print it, I'll have stacked. And one day my printer broke. And no money, man. My sister, 
Wanted her to give me a gift. She called me. Hey, your birthday is coming. Yes. Uh, usually I won't open my eyes and ask anything. She said, the Lord put in my heart. And for her to say the Lord, I, I'm very surprised the other day, you know. The Lord told me to buy for you something. I said, really? Sure. Okay. Anything. Uh, I, I said, can I know what, please? Uh, a dot matrix printer. I said, what? <laughs> Why a dot matrix printer? I said, that, uh, that's all I see you doing at home. Print, 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 print. Because I love this scripture. Somebody say, Amen. Thank God for the word of God. Because the day you are sowing in your spirit, you don't have to wait for the result. Be diligent in your sowing. Amen. Lead every thought, the Bible says, and purpose. So that's my question today. Now put it, put it back, the scripture verse 5 in uh, ESV, please. So it's easier to just focus. Okay. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, the word thought also has the word purpose in the Greek. So the Amplified Bible includes the word purpose. So my question for you today, we have to lead every thought, but why is the word purpose in sight? You see, when I'm leading my thought, my destiny is towards God. If you don't lead your thought, your destiny is being robbed again. Your purpose in life is being robbed. And so God wants us to fixate our purpose towards him and bring it all to the obedience of Christ. And the word captive in the Greek simply means a prisoner of war. You can't do anything outside that framework. And I want to encourage my brothers. Sometimes the things I say, you may think, oh, that's so deep. It's not deep. It's the principle of scriptures. It's principle of scripture. I, I know some of the guys, many have been to military and the family is having military discounts. All that is nice and, oh, we should go to the military as well. Try. If you survive, good for you. And no wonder they have those benefits because someone paid the price to go in and not everybody was blessed to come back. That's the truth, you see. The benefits that we have today, someone paid the price. If today you will pay the price, tomorrow you will walk in a different level of authority. And that is why I don't, I'm rooting everybody Sunday after Sunday and all our pastoral team and leadership team fix in the word. I'm not saying don't have encounters. Find the word there. Find the word there. Be strong in the word of God. Amen. We will preach so much of the Bible that you will start buying a Bible. <laughs> huh? So much. You look at that. Pastor. Brother Jeff already said, I've got one. <laughs> Are you enjoying it? I want to lead every thought captive like a prisoner of war. And then the Lord showed me something else. Let me show you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, let's see. Now it's 12.15. 12.30, I should be wrapping up, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Now, are you ready? I, I, I've, I, I preach about this almost many times, man. One shot of the word saying thousand times, but I've done it. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high... He led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. What is so special about this scripture? He led a host of captives. Earlier I quoted the scripture, bring all your thought to become captivated, captive like a prison of war inside Christ. The Bible says he will lead the captives, the host of captives. And when God says, sees that his word is residing in you, he will give you gifts of heaven. He gave gifts to the captives. Jesus didn't go to find the diamond in the mountaintops. He went right to hell, find all the fellas there, 
brought them out, and he gave them the gifts. It's very different from human understanding, isn't it? We choose all the right people. God chooses all the wrong ones. <laughs> Are you ready to be trained by Christ? Yes. It takes a lot of discipline to put yourself through. But the benefits are higher. Authority does not come by manipulation. Keep that in mind. Do you remember how serpent manipulated Eve and tried to regain that authority? So we got to keep in mind, authority doesn't come by manipulation. Number two, authority doesn't come by seduction. Remember what Delilah tried to do? Seduce. It is almost like a cliche of the business world. If you want to come to the top, you must know how to seduce. But God's word is so different. Authority doesn't come by stealing. Genesis chapter 27, 26 says, even though Jacob was a victim of what his mother said, the Bible does say he stole the blessings. It doesn't come by all this. You don't have to be promoted by telling and putting your other friends down. You know what he did? Do you know what he do? And many of us have lost our promotion because someone said things about you that you are not sure. Many promotions were gone because of that. Only God knows how many people have committed suicide because they were looking for that promotion to have a break with their accounts. When that was gone, some killed themselves. Only God knows how many innocent blood was shed because of someone who lied. Are you with me? And that is why God wants us to put the record straight. Let me go to the second part of this entire scripture we started. It says, hands too strong. In a vision I saw, strong hands, very manipulative hands, were meddling and messing and pushing and pulling and struggling. And so I was asking the Lord, what is the vision of these hands? He said, you will see manipulative hands in these end times, which will be involved to bring chaos and confusion to the world's system and the livelihood of my people. People out there in the round table could plan, round table means it's not Oval Office, I'm not talking about that. Conference room. They can plan for personal pursuits. Someone's gain will create an entire country into slavery. And so can I bring you to one last scripture and we enjoy this morning. Psalms chapter 18, verse 16 to 19. The book of Psalms chapter 18, verse 16 to 19. David was struggling with Many things in his personal life. Psalms chapter 18 is one of a very good scripture for counseling, personal deliverances, soul transformation, identifying with troubles of your soul, suicide. This is the scripture to come in. But God, the Bible says, now this is the declaration of David. He sent them on high. In other words, what God is going to do for you. He sent from on high, something came from heart on high. Okay, that's number one. Number two, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. Next verse, he rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. Verse 18, they confronted me. The King James Version says, prevented me. In the day of my weakness or calamity, or calamity, how do you say calamity? Calamity. Calamity. But the Lord was my support. Oh, the one word but changes the whole thing. <laughs> and he brought me, the moment the Lord became his support, verse 19, he brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. My brothers and sisters, I want you to know the action phrases of God in your situation. What did he send from high? The Holy Spirit came from on high. 
When you are crying and weeping, he just won't listen to you and give you a tissue paper. He sends you the Holy Spirit from on high. Look at the action phrases God gets involved in us. He sent me from high. He took me. He drew me out. He rescued me. Whoever who hates me, he pulled me out from them. And whoever who prevents me from moving forward, he confronts them. The book of Isaiah chapter 49 says, I will contend with those who contend with thee. Now that is not a scripture anybody or everybody can claim. It is for a group of fellows who are walking with God in the pleasure of his will. Then your enemy becomes his and his enemy becomes yours. It, it, it becomes an exchange. You think about that. Too strong. Lord, I can't take it anymore. Please handle for me. Too strong. He steps in. Have you been there when you cried and cried? You can't take it anymore. Your prayer can't do anymore. Your faith just can't push it anymore. You don't know when your fasting is going to stop. You don't know what else scripture you got to say. Lord, I'm giving up. He steps in. You wonder why he waits till that moment. I'm not sure. It's a little bad habit of God. Really, I preached about that about 25 years ago. He always turns up on the last day. I don't, I'm not sure why. When the wine dries up, he comes in. On the last day, he shows up. So I realize, and I preach on the day, don't give up till the last day because you don't know when is your last day. Yeah. Amen. Oh God, they have already given me the last day. You know, God has this power to extend the last day yes. because he has not finished with you yet. Amen. When God is at work, no human hands can interfere. And I'm saying not because from being and encouraging you, I'm saying because I'm a recipient of the interventions of God. Even doctors can say you're going to die today. God will extend you for another three months because he has not decided to bring you up. Somebody say? Amen. That's God's way of doing things. My brothers and sisters, in these last days, there will be powerful pro uh, 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 policies there will be new laws against the Bible, as it's already there. Government agencies will be set up to do a lot of more things. Regulations will come, and we will start crying, it is too powerful and too strong for me. If God promises, I will supernaturally deliver you, supernaturally transfer you, supernaturally intervene in your life. Supernaturally, money will just translate and come up. Now you may think, oh, oh God, I'm praying for supernatural top up of my bank account. You know when that happens? When you supernaturally top up someone's account. When you give, it shall be given unto you. A lot of people are praying selfish. Oh God, uh, they already got a million dollars. I oh, multiplied into two million. Then give the one million away, two comes back to you. The principle of God. What you don't give, you won't get. I'm not preaching about money. It's a principle of God. There were many times I didn't have money to give, but I gave my love, my time, my peace, my encouragement, the scriptures that I know. I know how to travail. I have prayed for people. And I remember years ago, man, when I was going through my, my small days, right? A, a brother has to raise money because his 10-year-old boy uh, had cancer, brain cancer, brain tumor. And he said, brother, I'm raising funds. Can you please help? You know, $25,000 they need within seven days. And I had none. And I had a, a gold chain that my, uh, my, my father gave me. Uh, uh, when I got married, I, I took out the chain. I said, I gave it to you. You go and do whatever you want to do. I gave the chain to him. I said, okay. But he was crying, brother, I don't have enough. Someone from Malaysia uh, promised him they will give him some money, like $10,000 or so but he needs to drive eight hours. This man was distraught. He was depressed. For him to drive eight hours, I know he may die on the road. Because he was crying every moment, thinking about this little boy, you know. Because they have timeline, the tumor was growing. So I say, brother, I don't have anything. I don't have any more money than this gold chain that I gave you. But one thing I have, I'm going to give it to you. I can drive. So I drove him for eight hours, and I drove back for eight hours. 
That's all I knew. I could drive, brother, I'll give it to you. Today, there are sons and daughters God has given me who's willing to drive me. Do you understand what I'm saying? My brothers and sisters, sow every kind of feel that you can find in the things of God. When that time comes for you, you will reap God's goodness and blessings. When you are there for people who need you, when you need someone, God will send people around you. If you think money is the answer for everything, and when you are dying in your dead bed, someone will give $100 on your bed. And what are you going to do with that? Money is not going to save you that day. Love and peace. One church member of mine in Singapore, he said, Pastor, you know, what kind of church do we have? Uh, people. <laughs> people. You know, when I'm going through trouble, no one called me, no one uh, encouraged me. Uh, okay. Do you call others? You say no. So that's what you get back, right? But I text everybody. Did you, anybody text me? Everybody texting me. You see, you got back what you text. <laughs> You see, when you sow your presence, you get presents. When you sow a text, you get text back. You sow emoji, <laughs> you get two emoji back. <laughs> but you make a call and say, we are praying for you, you get the prayer back. Amen. Let's all stand up together and pray. I pray, God, the love of God our Father. The authority of Jesus that has been released upon us. The sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. Be upon each one of us and our children. Today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Till we meet again in Christ Jesus. And somebody say, Amen. Amen. Amen.